Science. Engineering. Medicine. Medicine. Chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanity. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Hi folks, happy February. I hope you're well. I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, the TV encounter that went viral. Robin Shattuck recalls his discussion with a vaccine sceptic on primetime telly. Also, it's LGBT plus history month and Imperial is celebrating. My first personal favourite so far has been listening to Spotify. I was listening to it on my way to work and going home and staff and students are invited to contribute songs for community playlist to showcase favourite LGBT plus artists. And equally uplifting, the clinical researcher and the patient whose life is transformed thanks to a pioneering asthma trial. All right, folks, so lots to get through, so let's jump straight in. And we have Ryan O'Hare here to start us off with some yeast-related news. What's going on here, Ryan? Hi, Gareth. Yeah, so we have a, a very, very cool biotech story. Um, essentially, we're researchers from Imperial working with partners in Singapore, the National University of Singapore, have basically genetically engineered yeast to become tiny little factories to produce the basis of drugs for dementia. How has that come about then? Because I wouldn't usually associate yeast with dementia drugs necessarily. Exactly. I mean, yeast, we, we all know yeast, these familiar little fungi. We've been working with them for thousands of years to, uh, you know, to brew beer, to bake bread and things like that. Uh, they were also one of the first cellular organisms to have their genomes mapped. We know them intimately, we should say. And in this clever bit of research, what scientists have done is introduced genes from related fungus called ergot fungus, which people might recognise. It It causes disease in crops like wheat and rye. And they've introduced these genes which make a specific chemical compound called D-lysergic acid and introduced those genes into uh, yeast, basically through the same fermentation process which yeast normally um, used to you know, make the alcohol in beer and uh, the, the lovely sort of chemicals and, and compounds that we have in bread. They use this process to make this chemical compound called DLA. So ergot does make DLA and they want yeast to have that same DLA producing property that uh, ergot has. That's, that's exactly right. Um, what it comes down to is this compound uh, forms the basis of, of lots of drugs which are um, used to sort of uh, treat Parkinson's disease as well as migraines and other neurological conditions. And it's estimated that we need about 10 to 15 tonnes of this compound, this DLA, each year to meet the global demand for these medicines. Currently, the, the main way of meeting this massive quota is to cultivate um, ergot, you know, this, this plant pathogen. However, it's not really uh, environmentally sustainable because we need wheat and rye and things like that on which to grow this parasitic fungus. So basically, it's moving it from arable land into tiny little vats, uh, which they can you know, use the yeast as uh, these mini biofactories to create it for us, hopefully saving the environment and producing lots and lots of this amazing compound. Well, you said it's a really cool story and you weren't wrong. Ryan O'Hare, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, now we're going to go live. Well, actually, it isn't live. It's a podcast, but let's say it is uh, to make it sound even more exciting to the newsroom, to the busy press office here at Imperial College, where we find Caroline Brogan. This is another nature related story, in this case, about how engineers are taking inspiration from nature. So tell me more. Yeah, so um, engineers at Imperial have taken inspiration from things like dragonflies and cicadas and sharks to create materials that can do things like pop bacteria and reduce drag on ships. Cicadas and dragonflies have these very tiny ridges on their wings, which meet at right angles. We can't see this with the human eye, this is on the nanoscale, but they meet at right angles to produce spikes, um, which, you know, if a bacteria comes along and it's wanting to settle, it will pop, and that's how they keep themselves naturally clean. And sharks, likewise, have ridges on their 
skin to help reduce drag while they're swimming through water. So engineers at Imperial made their own version of, of a material that does just this. Uh, and they're thinking they can coat things like the inside of buses, which is a trial that they're about to begin. Uh, to see if they can create a naturally antimicrobial surface without having to use chemical cleaners, which can you know, contribute to things like antimicrobial resistance. All right, Caroline, thank you very much indeed for that. That's Caroline Brogan. And also in that news section, we heard from Ryan O'Hare. Well, it's not often that you get a discussion about the nature of scientific authority on a primetime TV show on BBC One. But that's just what did happen in some gripping telly the other week on Question Time. An audience member with a philosophy background was challenging the panel during a discussion about compulsory vaccines for frontline healthcare workers. In questioning the safety of vaccines, he said, an appeal to authority is not an automatic win of an argument. A fair point from philosophy, perhaps. But almost in the same breath, he incorrectly went on to state that Robert Malone, now a prominent vaccine sceptic, had invented mRNA vaccines. It's nonsense, responded the scientist on the panel, none other than Professor Robin Shattuck of Imperial's Faculty of Medicine. Now, what struck me was the courteous, if forthright, tone of the discussion. There was no shouting, no name-calling, no scoffing at the sceptic, just calm statements about the facts. If only all COVID disagreements could be so. Well, I caught up with Robin Shattuck soon after that broadcast as the clip from him versus the gentleman was going viral. So what were Robin's thoughts about the episode? Well, obviously, you know, this individual, like uh, a number of people out there, are concerned and feel that there has been a cover up over some of the safety information about these vaccines. Everybody has a right to express an opinion. However, it comes down to the evidence that's out there, the, the weight of evidence, rather than cherry picking pieces of information that happen to fit your own viewpoint. And I think you know, science is driven by data and not by viewpoints. In fact, viewpoints are often change as the data changes. And of course, one thing that he put to you, which was clearly an error on his part, was that Robert Malone had invented the vaccine. And you put him right on that in pretty much a very soundbitey way, Robin. And your response was very measured. Some people on social media have said you have a very good poker face and you showed a good poker face when that happened. Well, Robert Malone, you know, has been cited with discovering RNA vaccines, uh, and that's clearly not correct. He did do some early work on RNA that may have eventually gone on to help the field. But you know, the distance between what he did and, and where we are now is a bit like somebody discovering the wheel of a cart uh, and feeling that he can comment on the safety of, of a modern day car. And I suppose this brings us to how you and other experts, other scientists, deal with false information. And that big question, I suppose, as to whether you should engage with these things or whether by engaging with it, you know, with your authority, with your status, whether you actually amplify those messages or whether the job should be to shut them down or indeed to put out for every bit of false information out there to put out a counterfact that is the truth. Uh, it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's always a fine line to balance. And obviously, uh, it's important not to give the impression that it's a level playing field, that, that some of these arguments have the same value as the kind of main body of evidence. So on the one hand, one wants to refute false information. On the other hand, you don't want to necessarily give it a platform that makes people feel it's legitimate. Well, I watched that question time and, and I felt it was very measured. I mean, to, people may disagree with me, but it seemed to be respectful to people who had a view that is maybe outside the orthodoxy. Did you feel it went that way too? Or when the lights went down and you drove home or however you got home, did you feel, well, that was a car crash? Did it, did it go OK? I, I mean, I think given the, the time that was allotted to the subject, I think it went OK. Obviously, one can always 
say more, do more. And any type of television is a bit sound bitey. So it was the best given the situation. And just as a hypothetical, supposing you were invited on to Joe Rogan's controversial podcast on Spotify, and even more, supposing you said, Robin, I want you to come on and have a sort of one-to-one with a vaccine sceptic. Maybe we'll get uh, Robert Malone back on, for instance. Is that a media appearance that you would refuse? Or would you say, nope, that's cool. I'm going to engage with that. I think it's important that I appear? I think I would probably be uh, hesitant particularly to engage with Robert Malone because we know that his viewpoints and the information he's already been putting out on the internet are factually incorrect. So I don't think it would be actually a productive discussion based on real data and the you know re- broad body of evidence that is out there. What do you think we, what do you think you have learned about putting important messages about public health and specifically vaccination in your case out into the public arena? What lessons can be learned? Well, I think we've been surprised in the UK. When when the pandemic started and we start, first started to think about vaccines, we thought we'd be lucky to get to 70% of the population vaccinated. And, you know, we're now well above 80%. So, we're really talking about hardcore groups that now are hard to reach. And they're either hard to reach because their you know, opinions are just fixed, you can't change them, or because they just don't trust the information that's out there. And I think it's that latter, the lot that, that perhaps are still anxious, still don't trust uh, information that may be persuaded that are the group that one needs to perhaps still pursue in a positive way. The danger is that the the, the sceptics will still impact whether it's on COVID um, or other vaccine strategies. For COVID, the battle's already been won because there are now billions of vaccinations going on uh, globally. There's little impact on the rollout of these vaccines from those small groups of people that really refuse to accept the, the overwhelming body of evidence about these vaccines. That's Robin Shattuck. And of course, you can see the whole of that BBC Question Time programme. It's on the iPlayer. Just to look at the 3rd of February edition. And there it is. Well, February is LGBT plus history month, not just raising awareness of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people, but also queer history. And by looking back, it's an opportunity to look forward to the challenges that are still to be overcome in improving LGBT plus visibility and welfare. During the month, there are talks, gatherings, Spotify playlists, film screenings and quizzes. Imperial is very much part of the action and Hayley Dunning has been hearing more from two of our community about their role models and their own roles within our LGBT plus community. Josh Hodge is a teaching fellow in the Department of Life Sciences and is chair of his department's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And Ji Young Yoon is a mechanical workshop technician in the bioengineering department and has been a member of Imperial 600 since 2018. For me, I identify myself as a lesbian and my pronoun is she, her. You don't see a lot of people like you around and it can feel quite a lonely place to be sometimes. And being part of Imperial 600, it makes you feel like you have a community of people. I'm a mechanical engineer and there's not a lot of female here as well in this sort of job family and uh, South Korean woman. So for me, that's uh, important to actually also highlight intersectionality not just having focus of LGBT+, plus, but as a whole. I would identify her as a queer person. And to me, that generally means that I don't fit into a binary system of heterosexuality and homosexuality. And it's incredibly important that queer represents not only, I guess, a label for some people, but it's also a great way to disrupt the binary that we generally try to put things in so whether that's homosexuality and heterosexuality whether that's a man whether that's a woman whether that's cis whether that's trans and I agree that having binaries is helpful but it's also great to frustrate them and for me that's what I think the LGBT community in general is great at doing is blurring the lines. What is going on at Imperial for LGBT plus history month? My first personal favorite so far has been listening to Spotify. (laughs) I was listening to it on my way to work and going home. And Stefan students are invited to contribute songs for community playlist. 
to showcase favorite LGBT plus artists. And we have LGBT plus film club event, we have LGBT plus history month quiz. We have a PowerPoint party presenting LGBT plus heroes. And this event is hosted by me. So hopefully a lot of people will turn up and learn about more historic and present LGBT plus figures that uh, wasn't celebrated enough. And then also giving recognition for their achievement. Can you give some examples of people who will be celebrated there or who your hero is? So for a STEM role model, we can think of a person like Alan Turing. For me, I'm a big sports fan. So for sports, I can talk about Billie Jean King, who was not only a great tennis player winning 12 singles and 16 doubles Grand Slams. She has been a great role model for LGBT people. She identifies herself as a lesbian and part of a community, but she also fought really hard for equal pay for women in sports. Now, Josh, I know you're doing something a little different, which is looking into current issues for LGBT plus people in education. So what are some of the issues you're exploring? I think there's a lot of issues, I guess, within education. What we tend to find is LGBT students do report that active learning can be a lot more effort. Students working together, but we tend to miss what that actually represents and assume that everybody is going to be a good human, if you want to call it that, and work together. Because most of the time they're filtering words that, that they might want to use or not or not use. There's a dominance of masculinity and and masculine behaviours that sort of translate into microaggressions. Quite recently, one of the departments at Imperial did withdraw a fieldwork in Oman based on their laws around being an LGBTQ plus person. What are your hopes for the future of LGBTQ plus people? I would love to get to a place where nobody has to come out, has to make this part of what we might call our identity, such such a big thing. When somebody comes out as queer, as gay, as lesbian, that automatically is something that's fixed. And if they want to be more fluid with their sexuality or gender, actually coming out, in my opinion, fixes some of that. And you almost have to come out again (laughs) and again and again. And I personally would like that to be changed. For the future, what I would love to see is when I go to those events, it's not just everyone from LGBT plus community, but more ally involvement. Because I strongly believe that most things, we can't do it just us shouting what's right or wrong. I think we need more allies. And I think having more allies, it's only going to make it strong. That's Ji Young Yoon. And you also heard there from Josh Hodge, and they were chatting there to Haley. Well, Jilly had no quality of life. Her asthma was so severe she could barely breathe without her inhalers. She was constantly coughing. She couldn't even walk the dog. But then she took part in the Targets of Bronchial Thermoplasty and Severe Asthma, or TASMA, clinical trial. And since then, her life has been transformed. You only need to look at her photo to see the healthy, happy and fun woman she now is. And capturing patients in photos is the whole point of a lovely project to document not just the jillies of this world, but also the researchers whose innovations have affected their lives. It's a new online photography exhibition. And in this uplifting interview, Maxine Myers meets Jilly Ellis and also advanced research nurse practitioner and Imperial Research postgraduate, Chedo Kaneha. I've been doing research with the respiratory departments And it's with regards to interventional bronchoscopy, where we've had patients treated with asthma and also COPD. So we go down the lungs, um, treat them. And I've been doing this for the last two decades, and many of which are now in clinical or national guidelines or even has influenced international guidelines. Jilly, you were diagnosed with asthma around 15 years ago. Can you just give us a sense of what life was like for you before you went on to the TASMA clinical trial? Life was not great beforehand. I think gradually the asthma just seemed to get worse and worse. I was, I had a nebulizer at home that I had to use constantly, it felt like. I had a portable nebulizer that I couldn't leave the house without just in case. I was taking lots of doses of steroids you know I couldn't run for a bus or walk very far but it wasn't it wasn't great <laughs> it was pretty bad coughing all the time sometimes 
coughing for 24 hours at a time, just non-stop, which I don't know if you can imagine how bad that is. It's just, it's, yeah, pretty horrible. And after going on the TASMA trial, how did things change for you? Did you notice any change and what's been the outcome since? It was gradual. I think your body has to heal from it or your lungs have to heal from it, from the swelling. It feels like after a couple of months, I suddenly was free (laughs) and that I could breathe and... I still take inhalers and I still take um, my tablet at night time. But if I went out without my inhaler, I wouldn't even notice that I didn't have it with me. (laughs) You know, that's the difference, I think. It's just so incredible. It is such a brilliant feeling. (laughs) And Cello, when you hear that account of how Jilly's life has changed as a result of the work that you and the team have done, how does that make you feel? It's what keeps us going. So knowing patients like Jilly. I don't call them patients anymore, Jilly. I call them good colleagues, good friends. It is what and why we do what we do. People like Jilly, we call our patients, but it could be our mom, our dad, our brothers, our sisters. So if it could make a difference to one person, and imagine if it could make a difference to many other. One way or another, we develop a relationship that it actually strengthened and made us more fulfilled doing what we do. It gives us more reason to continue what we're doing. I just wanted to ask you, just when I first approached you guys about taking part in the project, why did you say yes? We are the researchers. We are not actually comfortable with these kinds of interview. Imagine people from the lab or in the clinical practice, in the research practice, in the front line, in the academic. We are not a glorified, how do you call it, celebrities. But when I, we've seen what you, Maxine, and Tim are doing, it's actually showcasing what we have shared to the rest of patients and the world, and if other people can benefit from it, then why not? Yeah, I mean, that's the reason why I wanted to do it as well. (laughs) What can I give back to them? I can't give anything, you know. I'm so grateful and, you know, they changed my life. What can I say, you know? Of course I would do anything. And to show people, look at my life, it's so different. I was... (laughs) I hate to say it, but, you know, pretty suicidal before, because what kind of life do you have? Breathing's everything. And if you can't breathe, your quality of life is bad. (laughs) So like Cello says, if this showcases what her work does, then I'm all for it. (laughs) Just my final question to you both. I mean, people are going to read your stories. They're going to see your photos. What one thing would you like them to take away from your own personal story? One thing that I would like people to take away when they read my story or my picture is clinical researchers, we make sure safety is paramount. So it's an extensive eligibility criteria, making sure that patients who undergo these kinds of research are well investigated, are well seen. The first thing that comes on our mind is patient safety all the time. Sometimes you just have to go for things. If you say to somebody, you're going to have some operations and they're going to burn the inside of your lungs, (laughs) it's the most terrifying thing to think that you're going to go to sleep and somebody's going to do this to you. I just had to face the fear and do it. And look what I've gained out of it. The incredible Jilly Ellis and research postgraduate Cello Kaneha talking to Maxine Myers. And you know how you often listen to stuff on podcasts and wonder what the people look like? Well, with Cello and Jilly, you can find out. That's the whole point. Check out their story and photos via the Imperial College Academic Health Science Centre website. And that'll do us for this month. We'll be back in March with more. But don't forget, we are on all your favourite podcasting platforms, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud. I've probably missed a few out, but there you go. So thanks for listening, folks, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.